I wanted to start, um, uh, you know, obviously I'm a securitization lawyer, and I think the worst deal I ever worked on uh, was, was, was the Leyland Daff securitization uh, that closed in late December 1992, and I was much younger. And I was in the securitization team at, at, at Clifford Chance. We were opposite Freshfields, and it was a, a, a securitization of higher purchase receivables for vehicles that had been done before, and the first securitization ever of lease receivables and dealer floor plan receivables. It was a desperately ugly deal, and everybody hated everybody, and uh, it closed in a cloud of poop and feathers on 22nd December 1992, and 44 days later, the DAF group went insolvent. Uh, the deal the deal tanked and euro money promptly rated it dog deal of the year and published a cartoon with a dog urinating on the leyland daff deal and the reason i'm telling you that was that it was a, an ungainly structure that had six spvs not one all there to achieve corporation tax and vat efficiency all right and it was an absolute mess but Oh, and also the uh, underlying lessors uh, uh, stopped paying their lease payments because they thought, well, DAF's gone bust, so they had to be chased up. The reason I'm telling you is the rating held, the AAA rating uh, published by S&P held. And, uh, and not only that, but apparently Moody's, uh, the rumor was they tried to shout a rate it. All the notes were paid in full. It was, I mean, it was a terribly messy deal. And then the reason I, I tell you that is that, that they, 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 they the view of securitization practitioners is if the credit structure works and the documents hang together, you're done. It's, it's, there's nothing more to it than that. Now, um, I'm sorry, I get this slide deck to move here. Um, this, the, this, this presentation, just quickly, the, the, the overview, I, have a, I obviously have an agenda here. <clears throat> the rated EU term securitization market, and by that I mean securitization backed by European assets suffered virtually no defaults during the great financial crisis. There has been a sustained EU regulatory assault on securitization under the guise of protecting investors. Placed EU term securitization issuance in 2020 was still only about 17% of 2006 issuance, which was the, the, the biggest year, if you like, prior to the GFC. And uh, I think well, it's my view, and I think it's shared by many others, regulatory barriers continue to preclude the recovery of the EU securitization market. And as you will know, from reading the blurb, the Bank of England and HM Treasury uh, have previously both stated more than once that securitization is important as a technique to fund the UK economy. And upon Brexit, as you know, Parliament adopted the entire uh, EU uh, approach or the to securitization, the, 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 the legislative key, if you like. And HM Treasury, uh, which we'll, and we'll get into this, having been apprised of all of the relevant evidence on term securitization performance and the effect of the current regulatory regime announced in December of this past year, that is broadly continuing its support for the current regulatory approach. And so let's take a closer look. And I start with uh, the first deal I'm aware of, um, which was written up, oh God, in the early 90s. Uh, um, and it was in 1769. As I understand it, um, following the Seven Years' War, the Silesian landowners were financially devastated. And so they banded together into what were called Landschaft. And under the terms of the arrangement, each landowner could issue a bond worth up to 50% of the value of, of his land but each bond was secured not only the landowner, not only in the land of the landowner who issued the bond, but on everybody's land. So these bonds were hugely over collateralized, and uh, it's uh, and I think I think that deal was one of the very early precursors of the fund brief. But in any event, it it's an illustration and a slightly a, a extreme illustration of, the, of my proposition that securitization really is a glorified is the issue of a, of a glorified over collateralized bond. That's all it really is. And we don't have time to go into the deep history, but the first US mortgage backed securities were issued in 1970, which is rather late in the game. And the first issuance of bonds backed by UK mortgages originated by the Bank of America, I think took place in 1985, right? And sorry, my, there we are. 
And so I, the students come from all backgrounds. Some will be very literate in securitization and, and some will just, just barely. Hear. This is a diagram I've been using for many years. We don't have time to go through it at all. It's a diagram that uh, I use in the LLM lectures. Um, and so why don't we just cut to the chase and give you the short version of the diagram. If you, if you, if you wanna see the a securitization the way most of us in the market see it, you've got a special purpose issuing company with really no assets, employees, or premises, a clean track record, no hair on it, as it were. And you, you put in that company, say 100 million worth of financial collateral, and you may issue a number of securities, but what you well, the most important, you issue about 80 million of secured bonds, bonds that are secured on that financial collateral, and which achieve a AAA rating. And that's basically what happens in RMBS deals. You need about a, you, you, you've got about 25% over collateralization in terms of the value, say 100 million of, 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 of residential mortgages, and you issue 80 bonds. And obviously there are eligibility criteria for the selection of the mortgages and uh, all, all manner of rating uh, requirements and now a host of regulatory requirements, uh, but that's basically the credit structure. And then there will be other bonds obviously issued that rank uh, below those AAA rated bonds will achieve lower ratings if indeed, and, and perhaps unrated. Uh, but that, that's basically what's going on. You got over collateralized bonds, okay? And my argument, I'm not sure it's an argument, I think it's an arithmetical truth, that term securitization usually results in the more efficient use of capital. Now, when we're doing a, a talk in person, I, I go to a flip chart and I get people, I, I draw little balance sheets of uh, a balance sheet of an originator and balance sheets for securitization vehicles. And, and I, 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 I think if we had more time and I could see more of you, I'd get each of you to take a, a sheet of A4 paper and draw a balance sheet, but I'm, I think I've tried to get you to imagine one where you've got an originator with 100, million, 100 worth of financial assets and it securitizes say 60, which sorry, and say that originator has 90 of liabilities and 10 of, sorry, not, and, and 10 of equity, securitizes 60 to a little SPV, uh, which of course has no equity to speak of and 60 of liabilities. And you picture it in your mind's eye um, one of the truisms of securitization is that in most cases, but not, not all, the originator, the mortgage company in this case, the mortgage lender will retain an exposure to the first loss of the, of the mortgages that it sold to the less PV, and it will have an interest in the profit generated by the securitized assets, and that profit essentially is the uh, income on the securitized assets, less funding and transaction costs of securitization. Where, where I try to go with this is usually what I, as I say, when I've got a flip chart is I end up drawing uh, you know, a balance sheet for the originator, a little balance sheet for the SPV, which will show 60 uh, of assets and liabilities. And of course the originator, it's hundred of financial assets changes from a hundred financial assets to 60 of cash, 40 of financial assets. It goes out and writes more business. So it ends up with a hundred financial assets and the game becomes you multiply the SPVs and you have more assets working for the originator uh, than you had before you securitized, but you have the same equity issued by the originator supporting all those assets. So the argument is it's more, it result, you're sweating, the, the capital is sweating more, it's producing more, it's, it's a greater return on equity. And, and there are lo loads of exceptions and qualifications to this. Uh, one of the obvious ones is that is that there will be losses on any book, and those losses are worn by the originators. They can only securitize so many times before it's going to, um, excuse me, erode its equity too much. And the other argument is if you, if you anal carry this analogy a bit further, I think you were looking at Northern Rock, um, but, but that's a separate story. So it, it, I, it's fair to say it's a more efficient use of capital, I think, and. And as I say, it started in the mid eighties in the UK. France started with special legislation, uh, Fonds commun de Créance in 1988, which amended several times. The point is that, that, that the government, the, the legislatures of the member states 
um, partic particularly in those jurisdictions where the, the law, typically civil code, uh, Napoleonic code jurisdictions, which were not friendly to securitization, in a sense that it's very difficult, to, but comparatively difficult to assign receivables, they all passed legislation to facilitate securitization. They were they were big tub thumpers. They in in like France, they got it wrong at first. They kept amending it to facilitate to, to make it more uh, flexible, the the legislative framework, and, and and easier to securitize. And the market grew, and it especially grew um, in the early to mid two uh, thousands when when Basel II was coming. Well, it wasn't in effect, but but the new risk weightings were on the horizon, and it it, it did lead to a, a, a burgeoning of structuring. And by 2006, just under a half a trillion uh, euro worth of bonds backed by European assets were issued in place. And then of course, as you know, in the, in the summer of 2007, um, uh, subprime market fears um, led to the, uh, what I'll call the appetite for the American, certainly the appetite of the US money market funds, the appetite for structured bonds just evaporated. London interbank market froze. <clears throat> And European securitization placed issuance dropped by effectively nearly 95%, that down to about 25 billion placed in 2009. And of course, we've got the, the great financial crisis, which, which uh, most of you know more about than I do. I, 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 I was in the center of it, but, but um, in a very narrow, dark little place. Um, now that I use the word stellar advisedly, <clears throat> during the great financial crisis, the biggest uh, crash, I suppose, since, since the Great Depression, rated uh, European ABS and RMBS uh, virtually no defaults. Uh, losses, such as they were, were generally confined to CMBS transactions and, and lower tranches of ABS and CMBS. And I should emphasize that we're, we're talking here about term securitization, you know, public, typically public bond issues, over collateralized bond issues. So I'm not talking about conduit securitization. It's a separate topic. We don't have time to go into it. And I'm certainly not talking about CDOs, CIVs, or, or, or CBOs, or the other alphabet soup of what I think was commonly referred to in a regulatory environment as resecuritization. Term securitization is all I'm talking about. Now, the cumulative, this is reported by S&P anyway, as at mid-14, <coughs> excuse me, the cumulative default rate for all European structured finance notes rated by S&P, including, and these were real beasts, CDOs of ABS, CMBS, and, uh, and corporate securitizations, at mid-2014, 1.58% of the original balance for all cla classes of rated notes. That, that's, that, that's quite something. Um, and of course, even the EBA uh, recognized that same year that, that, that uh, top-rated European RMBS and ABS um, Performed um, extremely well and, uh, and 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 better than the better than the vanilla the vanilla bonds. So so they they held fast. They they did very well. These 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 ABS and RMBS uh, European ones during the financial crisis. And I I would emphasize that uh, up to and during that crisis, there was virtually no EU regulation of securitization. I mean none. There was lots of uh, there was lots of legislation at the national level, but typically to facilitate it more than to regulate it. Uh, um, and the only EU rules I could think of that were relevant to securitization were rules regarding recognition of risk transfer by an origin by originator credit institutions, risk weightings of, of ABS and undrawn liquidity facilities on it's on you know, Basel II especially and uh, securitization specific prospectus requirements, the so-called building blocks. That's all we had. There was, there was no regulation at the EU level whatsoever. And there were, no, and we'll call it, there was, there, and there were no defaults. So securitization held fast just nicely for 24 years, something like that, okay? Now, this is my take on EU regulation of securitization following the GFC and as I was, discussing with Katrin before we, 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 we got on the air. Um, uh, there is such a huge volume of, 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 of regulation. It, it's very, very difficult to keep track. I remember it was back, uh, we were all experts in regulation of securitization. We securitization lawyers up until probably about 2013 or 14, um, when you started to need specialists. Uh, we, that, and the reason we were experts, there's nothing to know. But, but once you, you know, and, you, and we had 
122A, the, the, the amendment to the, the was a banking supervision directive uh, on, on the 5% retention. Well, that came in, that was big news. There were a couple of other little things, but by the time 2013, 14 came around, there was so much going on that I, I, I actually had to build a spreadsheet to keep track of it all and, and, and summarize it and model it. And, um, and, and if I'd known how much work it was going to be, I, I think I might've packed it up and closed my practice back then. It, it's, it's insane. It's gone to more than three meg now. It's insane because um, I summarized all of the relevant instruments and have hyperlinks and the whole lot. And I have a roadmap to how it all interrelates. And it's, uh, it's madness. Uh, but if we didn't do that, I don't see how we could practice law. Uh, we, you, you can't in this market. It can't be done unless you've got an army of PSLs. And I, we don't have an army of PSLs. Um, so it's a, it, it's, it's a lot. And, and in the next few slides I'm doing what really is impossible and, and improbable and, and silly. I'm going to try to summarize a few of the main heads of EU regulation or identify them. Um, the, there's risk retention and it's got a noble objective, which is to align the interests of the originator of the assets uh, and, and, the, and the investors. And I, one of the problems arose in the US, uh, which, which we copied, which is where the originator would uh, would either retain a minuscule piece of the of the of the risk, or it would sell off the entire risk. The first loss pieces were were, were structured as notes, and they, so the you, the, the originators would originate assets and flog off the whole lot, stay on the servicer, and they do a lousy job. Well, this this ghastly expression, skin in the game, is what the five percent is all about, and that number is broadly accepted. I think many in the industry think it's it's, it's too big too high, it's not necessary. And it also precludes um, uh, more junior entrants to come into the market because they got to fund that 5% somehow. But one of the points to note is that it's now some 13 years after the 5% requirement was introduced, they still haven't finalized the, regulate, the, the, the technical regulations and, and, and exactly what's required. Um, and, and, the, and so they're still at it. It wasn't, I mean, it's a moving target. Disclosure. Um, well, we're all in favor of disclosure. And uh, the deal that I mentioned at the beginning, DAF, uh, for a year, long before the EU began regulating, I used to, I used to wave that offering circuit around. It was a, God bless it, it was a fresh fields production. I said, that's the most opaque offering circuit I've ever seen in my life. Around about 70 or 80 pages, you couldn't make out what was going on. It did have the numbers on the credits, though. It did have the credit structure. And, and by God, the deal worked. Um, and uh, and we've and I'm a big believer in the prospectus and that in and 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 in my own approach to before I tell you why this is a load of rubbish, uh, what you were doing, you know, and I sit down with risk factors with a client and I get blank sheet of paper in a boardroom, tell me what can go wrong. Well, this can I write it down. And why don't we worry about it? Well, here here's why we think it's addressed or you don't have to worry too much about it. You write it all, you just if in doubt, you disclose. I'm a big tub thumper for that. Having said that, the EU have gone mad and the UK have followed them. The transparency requirements um, are significant and uh, the very, very deep, quite apart from the respect is very detailed information on assets and structures to be made available to investors, to competent authorities and on request of potential investors and for public deals to, through securitization repositories. Uh, there are technical standards regarding information uh, and details on securitization, including format and templates, which only came into enforce, into force a year ago, September. These are incredibly detailed templates for each asset class and some for general asset classes. They're very, very prescriptive. And it takes a huge amount of work to figure out exactly what's required, um, even as the regulations continue to change. Due, due diligence. Um, it's a bit rich for a securitization lawyer to say, uh, you shouldn't have rules requiring the banks to focus on what they're buying or the institutional investors to focus on their buying, especially when at the height of the, at the, height of the, of the uh, market frenzy just before the financial crisis, you'd get a RMBS issue and, and a, a guy say at Morgan Stanley Investments would get a phone call saying, hi, not you wanna buy this, we've got you, you're allotted this. This much, and at that moment, an email would appear on your screen with a with a copy of the prospectus attached, and the correct answer was yes, I'll buy it. 
the only thing he's looking at would be the the the, the, the price and the rating and and, and and he had to do that because the in those days and charles you can correct me the desk the rule of thumb of the desks had to increase their profits 20 percent year on year if you want to keep your job and if you didn't buy it at morgan stanley investments um, barclays would take it and if, if it went to Barclays, your boss would get a call explaining why you weren't going to get the next deal and you were going to lose your job. And it was as simple as that. And so that, so when I say, well, you know, the due diligence is over the top, it has been totally opposite the wrong way before. Uh, and I'm, I'm not saying there shouldn't be requirements. I am saying that the requirements are over the top and killing the market. So it's a bullet points. The investor has to vet various, you know, credit granting criteria, risk retention, underlying exposures, establish written procedures to monitor the position, be able to demonstrate to competent authorities, being the regulator, a, a, a comprehensive and thorough understanding of the position and underlying exposure. Well, the slide I showed you, I think it was slide two or three, where, where I give you the basic, basic, basic structure, shows you 80 over 100. Now, if you are an investor buying a AAA rated RMBS off a template that's been used maybe hundreds of times, produced by Clipper Chance or Linklaters or, or AN or whoever it is, do you need to go down and do loan level due diligence? Um, one of the points that seems to be missing entirely from the um, uh, EU regulatory framework is that the behavior of uh, of a portfolio is different to the portfolio of its constituent elements. I mean, uh, you can sift consumer finance receivables all you want, eligibility criteria and test for everything. You're gonna get a default rate of one to 3% per year. It's just the way life works in consumer finance. That's that's the rule of thumb. Um, and, 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 and going receivable by receivable isn't gonna help you. You don't know which, you don't know whether Mrs. Jones and in uh, New Haven is going to default or, or, or Joe Bloggs up in Newcastle, but you know someone's going to. It's the, portfo it's the portfolio performance that matters. And uh, as for monitoring it, well, there, long before there, this regulation, there were, there were investor reports that are reasonably detailed, I mean, that I would see anyway, and clients would send, if you'd ask for them, you could, you could have a look at them. So, so the, the, the question is how, how much work is actually required? We, we don't have, time to go into it. Standardization, that might be a misnomer. One of the, uh, it's not a Basel, there's a notion that, ooh, things got too complicated. I mean, maybe they were thinking of the Leyland Daff transaction, they might well have been. <clears throat> and we need a category of something that is often referred to as a gold standard, simple, transparent, and securitized securitization. And if you tick the boxes with your securitization, you get um, eligibility for LCR, you get more favorable risk weightings, capital risk weightings. And, uh, but, but ticking the boxes is, is a bit of a bother. I mean, for even a simple RMBS deal, north of a hundred requirements. Okay. Now, I, 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 from, I've been lucky enough to avoid RMBS deals. I think I've done maybe two or three in my career because they're the most boring transaction on God's earth. Uh, I mean, they're uniform, they're safe, uh, but they're boring as hell. Um, but I mean, to go through a, a regulation and, and tick boxes on RMBS, I mean, it's not, it's not necessary. I mean, whether, there, whether it's a sin to enact a regulation might be a, a, separate, a separate question. Is it necessary? No, get out of here. It's just not. Um, and and, and uh, we'll, we'll come on to that. Uh, uh, reg one, it's pathetic to try to deal with the uh, reg cap treatment um, or spread risk treatment for insurers with securitization uh, or, 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 or say collateral risk weightings for, for swaps and securitization in one slide. I think it's just a few points by way of illustration that, that if you don't tick the box for SDS, ABS are not eligible for LCR. Well, that, what's that mean for bank investors? It means they're not gonna buy it, are they? So your bank markets disappeared. Um, you're, you're, if, you're, uh, if you're not, STS, um, you're not you're not going to get you're not really going to get bought you're not going to get bought by an insurance company. In fact, no ABS is getting bought by insurance companies because they need they need for a mezzanine level to make enough money, and um, 
and and, and it, it's just it's, it's prohibitive. They can't do it. So insurers are more or less shut out of the market. Um, and you know there, there's little anomalies like a for 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 whoops Daisy. Triple A rated uh, non STS and non senior RMBS. If it's triple A rated, there'll be a there'll be a tranche above it. Costs about I can't see, quite see my slide with that in the way, but it co costs uh, about twice the risk weighted capital of a book of residential mortgage loans. In other words, you you slice off the top uh, was it twenty percent of the book to get the, or, sorry eighty percent of the book to get a triple A rating, and you, you get you get you get a worse rating if you're holding a raw mortgages. Uh, in, in other words, securitizing with the benefit of liquidity facilities and swaps and uh, and first loss and everything, you're penalized. So it that in itself is such an anomaly that it well, it's an anomaly. I'll leave it at that. Now the the markets, you you hear some tub thumping here and there in the markets, and Treasury was particularly bad uh, when 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 they when, in their in their call for evidence. Uh, in their in their, their report when they say well you know it's, it's actually looking fairly bright it's not looking bright at all uh, securitization placed issuance was uh, just under 120 billion in, in uh, three years ago 88 just over 80 billion in 2020 first half of uh, this of the past year it was uh, up 56 56 billion it's been hovering somewhere around 20 to 25 percent of the 2006 level and we're 15 years past the onset of the great financial crisis um uk place uk uh, that's all for you the uk place issuance is about 30 billion in 2019 20 billion in 2020 and uh, so it's, it's fluctuating 15 billion in the first half of last year so it's it's bouncing around but it's not that's not very much and sts uh again despite the tub thumping I would say it's not getting off the ground as it's more than twice as much AB non STS as, as STS is being secure securization is being issued in the UK and the EU. Um, people aren't doing STS. Uh, the explanation offered by AFME, uh, the Association of Financial Markets Europe, is that as a general rule, sophisticated investors don't really need STS. They, they, they're doing their own due diligence anyway. And there's a huge amount of available to them and less sophisticated investors um, will do the same will do the same will do the have to do a huge amount of due diligence and and, and, and credit analysis but they'd rather have the higher yielding non-sts transactions so it's not it's not really going anywhere i don't like it as a matter of principle because to me uh when you set that up as si the very the very title simple uh, transparent and standardized suggests that anything that doesn't meet that is complex, opaque, and, uh, and, and and off the wall. I mean, it, it's one or the other, isn't it? It's binary. It's it's setting up like a binary. And it's one of the reasons I don't like it. The effect. Well, this is common sense effect. This is not evidence. Uh, AFME will run the evidence. Um, it is obviously much more difficult, time-consuming, and costly for originators to securitize than it was prior to the EU regulatory project. Securitization paper is obviously much less attractive to institutional investors by reason of compliance constraints, prohibitions, and penalty risk weightings. And I think one of the very big points is the continuing, continuing process of regulation, uh, some 14 years after it began, results in continuing market uncertainty. And as a rule, um, the fixed income markets don't like regulatory uncertainty. I mean, not many markets do, but but this is a side observation for the continental lawyers out there and, and as a common lawyer you know the way we grew up in the law we kind of view laws it's like uh, roads and bridges and walls and things you, you build these things and you leave them in place and you know grab you know, the wall starts to crumble you repair it or you might add on to it a bit but you you know they're there there's it's more it's it's, it's it's developing, it's always developing the common law, but it's broadly static, the shape is static. It seems to me that on the civil law side, at least on the regulatory side, it's a dynamic process. It's a continuing process, it's a continual process of revisiting regulation and trying to adapt it to what are perceived market changes. I mean, the, 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 the spreadsheet that we've got, a huge amount of it, the laws just aren't in effect anymore because they keep revisiting it. Drive someone like me nuts. 
Uh, and I don't know whether it's a civil law mindset or a continental regulatory mindset. Maybe we maybe we're going to pick it up in the UK, but but it's not good. It's certainly not good for our markets. Right. There was a global ABS conference in London in September. Uh, and I mean, these conferences went on hold for a while. They're usually a big shindig down in Barcelona. Uh, and there's one in there's one in uh, the ABS uh, West in Las Vegas, which of course was in the big short. And there's ABS East in Miami. It's a big it's a big uh, free for all where people get together and and uh, try to try to get work and and and, and give talks. But but there were a number of speakers um, at this conference, um, and, and of course regulation used to hardly ever be talked about at these conferences. Now it's it's the only topic. And the, the buzz phrase, these are all from partners in big law firms that are well-known names. That, you know, th these are the phrases that are used. I mean, it's an avalanche of regulation. It's, it's moving all over the place, which is another way of saying it's continually changing. Um, one in a slightly cheeky partner said, you know, invest, is, investors, he asked for prefer non-SDS quote, so they don't have to read all this guff and, you know, roll back. That, that, that's a that's not law. That's an industry. That's that's what people are saying. You know. Um, now, the whole point of this little talk is um, <clears throat> Treasury is required by Article Forty Six of the Securitization Regulation Report to Parliament by the beginning of this year on, among other things, the effect of the Securitization Regulation on the function of the Securitization Market. They called for evidence in June, and they reported in December. Now. In their report, they said they got 21 responses. One of them was me, um, which you've got if you want it. Um, and another one uh, was from a, a, a one submitted jointly by AFME and UK Finance. Uh, and that's a fairly detailed, carefully worked presentation that, that doesn't say on it, but is written up by uh, Clifford Chance, uh, the, the, the AFME one for the UK. Uh, and and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good appendix, and it's a, it's, a, it's a very careful and thoughtful presentation. I don't think it's quite as stroppy as the one I submitted. Um, now, this is a, a, a side point. Uh, AFME has uh, on their website 45 members, including some very grand names, you know, CC, a &O, Barclays, HSBC, Santander, City, S&P, Moody's, Fitch is in there, I don't have room for Fitch, Deloitte, PwC, BNY Mellon, BlackRock, and many more, all of very grand names. UK Finance represents about 300 firms. And these firm, and, and the, the, the submission was on behalf of all those members, expressly on behalf of all those members, okay? And it's interesting that, um, that, that, that in their report anyway, Treasury treated as one of 21 responses. So they had responses from academics. So Katri and I suppose if you'd submitted a response, yours would be in there with AFME. And no offense, but they're bigger than you are. <laughs> yeah, in terms of numbers. Um, hi, my, well, we'll highlight to the range realm, but my response. Well, this is all I said was what I've said to you anyway. There were no credit losses on UK term securization during, during the GFC. Um, and there was no regulation. And, uh, and, and the markets remain moribund since, since 07. The evidence shows that. It's there, it's in the numbers. It's, it's not really up for, it's not, I don't think it can be disputed. Um, and I, 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 my line is that the regulatory approach, which we've adopted from Europe is based on a false premise, which is that securitization is particularly dangerous. Now, I'll be the first one in the queue to say, yeah, CDOs are a bit ropey. I'd look at those pretty closely if I allowed them at all. And I, I'd sure, you know, I'd sure look at sieves. Now, I've done a huge amount of work in CIVs and uh, you know, a lot of other stuff out there, but term securitization gets serious. And the, and the regulations that clearly impeding recovery of the market, um, the regulatory barriers, I said, distort the mark, the credit markets. And uh, I, I call, I've just asked politely for a wholesale review of securitization regulation. Now, the highlights of the UK, uh, of, the, of the AFNI and UK finance response. Now, th this, I put this into two slides in a bit, and, and it, it is cheeky because I've, I've, I've selected some quotes. These are very detailed responses, and there were some positives and negatives. There, there's some complimentary words that were said. I've ignored all that. I've picked out what I want, which supports my cause, but it was said. And uh, they, they're the first, you know, they point out that the STS framework 
has been disappointing, though not entirely surprising. It doesn't really work. They, they talk about solvency too, and the effect on, on insurance investment, it was investment by insurers and reinsurers and securization paper. They're not, they're not buying it, they're out of the market now. And because of quote, very harsh risk factors, that's a fact. The LCR treatment has quote, significantly harmed secondary market liquidity for securitization instruments and bank treasuries demand for this issuance. Obvious, I, it, it's, it's a fact, uh, not an opinion. And uh, as on the opinion side, uh, these hundreds of institutions have said through AFI and UK Finance, the benefits of the securization regulation, quote, are outweighed by higher compliance requirements and costs, especially for issuers. And the securization regulation, although intended to encourage new investors, has had the opposite effect. So they said this cumulative effect is to make the securization market shallower and less liquid. Uh, the due diligence and disclosure requirements have, in fact, have not, in fact, created meaning, meaningful market safety, nor have they done much to, de to develop the market or increase financing of the real economy. And they say it is excessively prudent, which I think is a fair comment. Now, all that was submitted at the beginning of September, uh, to September, to, to, to HM Treasury, and they're... they're response that when quite some detail and there are many topics that I'm not issuing here on on you know a green securitization and uh, whether whether you know a treasury has, should we get rid of SPVs and have a have a government body act as an SPV I mean silly things um, but they as I mentioned they they counted 21 responses and appeared to uh, accord them all equal weight uh, you know 16 responses the respondents answered questions on the overall effect. The vast majority of the respondents conveyed their general support for the securitization regulation. Well, I, I, does that, that wouldn't include AFME and UK Finance, I suppose, because they didn't, but they represent more than, more than you'd think. Um, and they said HM Treasury assessed that securitization regulation remains an important element of the functioning regulation of the securitization market. We're committed to the ongoing and effective implementation. We do not see sufficient evidence to support significant changes to the capital treatment of securitization, which is consistent with the Basel standards, which is largely true. So where does that leave us? Um, and I'm going to throw it open to questions, but I mean, from where I sit, all the evidence in the world will not move HM Treasury to revisit the regulatory treatment of securitization. I mean, if you read through, if you even do an eye scan through what AFME submitted um, and which I provided to, to Queen Mary to circulate, it's, it's a staggering. And the, the UK securitization market will not, in this regulatory environment, recover. Like, it won't grow. It's not going to happen. Uh, not, not at all. And so, uh, to quote um, a brother-in-law I don't have a lot of time for, it is what it is. That's where we're at. It's not going to change. So I, I, I leave with questions, and you, have, you may have questions for Matt, questions for, for, for you, um, and a number of you, actually. You know, if you have hundreds of billions sterling of investment funding, and it's artificially diverted from top quality credits to other quarters of the credit markets, what, what happens to the pricing of credit? And we have at least one economist in our midst. Um, what kinds of market distortions, if any, arise? Uh, and what happens if credit is mispriced and markets are distorted? I mean, you could obviously implicit in this is the proposition, my proposition, that the regulatory effect, of, of, of the effect of the, of the uh, EU securitization that key is to distort the credit markets and to distort pricing. Um, and so it's a rhetorical question that, that uh, uh, has been asked by, by one notable economist, when, when those, those responsible for important decisions that affect the market do not bear the consequences of decisions, you know, what could possibly go wrong? Um, and, and that's pretty much it. That's, uh, those are my questions. Uh, what, I mean, you, you can't argue that there were no defaults in the EU securization market. I mean, not, not materially in, in any respect. You can't argue there was no, there was no regulation. Um, you can try to make a case for regulation, but, but there's a huge amount of it. And, and, and I think it, it, it's wiser industry heads than I see that as, as stopping the growth of the securitization market. Well, does it matter? 
Uh, maybe it doesn't matter for economic growth. I, it probably does. I, I bet it does. But I'm really more concerned with uh, distorting you know, pricing of credit. I get really worried about that. I think back to when was it 2000 and about 07, sorry, 06, early 07, there was a BNP covered bond priced two base, top rated, obviously, two points, uh, two basis points was a spread. And, and, and as I recall, a couple of years later, it was uh, 112 basis points, same credit. So, you know, swings in pricing of credit, it's an open question. Anyway, as if I could quote Forrest Gump, that's all I have to say about that. Over to you. Thank you very much, Mark. I thought that was uh, very interesting and thought provoking. And um, if there are uh, any questions from the audience, feel free to raise your hand um, via the, the Zoom function, or if you're not able to open your microphone, you can post it in the in the chat as well. Um, and while we do that, I, I might ask a question myself, Mark. Um, abusing the, the privilege as a share. Um, you, you're talking about the fact that um, the EU market hasn't really had any sort of significant default. Um, what do you think, how can you compare that to the situation in the US and how do you think they're oh. tackling the regulation better? Oh, I, do you know, I, I confess my, I, I'm not uh, an expert in the U, US regulation securitization, but, um, as we discussed just before um, the seminar, um, there was widespread fraud in America in the subprime market. I mean, the, I mean, I quote the big short. I mean, it was too far off the mark. Um, uh, the, and and uh, I, I, I believe, I, I seem to recall, I don't, I don't want to slander them, but I, I, I seem to recall Morgan Stanley and Goldman's were, were, were both convicted of fraud in New York courts. I mean, it was, it was really bad. Um, it's a different market, and uh, there's an the explanation of why. I mean, they, uh, look, at U.S. securities, they do things differently there. They think differently. The Americans are, are really different to us, um, despite my Canadian accent. I'm an English solicitor, and I think about as British as you can get um, after 30 years here. Um, uh, they, 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 their, their structures are different to ours in America. One of the big reasons is that they, they three, well, three big reasons. First, their bankruptcy law is very different to ours. We're very creditor friendly and they're not. Um, their tax uh, system is very different to ours, not just in terms of its complexity, but in, in terms of its, its, its tendency towards substance over form. So for example, a, a, a flow through lease securitization will be taxed like a debt instrument, whereas here it'll be taxed as Schedule D case one income because it's, 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 it's it, 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 under a trust, it would be, it would be an interest in, uh, in, in actual lease receivables. And, uh, and the third reason, it's a bit cheeky, but the Americans never really understood trusts. Yeah, they don't understand trust law, they don't get it. And that goes for their judges, their academics. They don't, I mean, I, the people I like to think understand trust law are, are Maitland people. <laughs> which is very unfashionable these people these days uh, but and, and more, more, our courts tend to understand trust law and and the trusts of course give rise because the way that the Americans use trusts very differently to ours they, they just react and think differently and I did serve time in a very large American firm and and had close encounters with American securitizers and by God they're different animals I, I they're, they're superior of course to us but they're very, they're very different. Uh, they speak a different language. So uh, the short answer is, I'm sorry, there was widespread fraud, their laws are different. Uh, also, I think, I think mortgage brokers were unlicensed back in the day in America. It's, you know, it was, it's different. We didn't have the defaults, they did. Okay, we have a question from, from Eric in the, in the chat. I um, can't read it all. Can you read, can, I can read part of it. Can you read? Can you read it to me? Yes, of course. Uh, do you think that once UK Parliament empowers the FCA Bank of England to rewrite the technical detail of UK securitization regulation, the situation will improve? Oh, that's a great question. I, I, would, I, I, would, I could only hope and pray. Um, I was so depressed when I read the Treasury <laughs> response in, um, in December. I mean, I, I have presented to Treasury. I went over there one time, and I, I must have been on Brexit and the... Uh, 
the consequence of Brexit for, for uh, UK, a hard Brexit for UK securization. And I, I remember we were up in some loft just just down in their, their offices off uh, Horse Guards Parade. And uh, they're, of course, they're all their like late 20s casual clothes. And I gave them a hard time. You're all Oxford, you're all PPE, gra PPE grads out of Oxford and you're, you're, you're SWATs. You drink all week and you write an overnight, you write a good essay and you gen up quickly. You say, yeah, that's about right, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and they move them around a lot. But they, but to be fair, uh, they've got friends in the city and they're, they're, they do know quite a bit about the, the way the city works. But um, I don't know that, uh, I don't know how much hope I'd hold for that. I mean, I know, I know the head of legal at, at Treasury. I mean, I'd love, I'd love to get him out and bend his ear. I'd love to get a line in there to Treasury. I'd actually turn it around. If anyone get, if I'm, I'd love, I was telling Katrin before we got on here that, um, we were on the, we're, 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 there's a client that we advised, we were on that version Atlantic recapitalization a year and a half ago. And the client, there were a lot of clients and a lot of law firms. The client that we were advising on that, we're doing serialization training for about seven or eight sessions, including a session on regulation. <laughs> I'd love to give that, to, I'd love to give that to Treasury. I mean, I really would. So we should, we should talk afterwards, see who you know. Uh, so sorry, that's a very long winded answer to the question. Um, one can only hope. Um, but a, a friend of mine um, that many of you will know, about Barney Reynolds over at Sherman, who's a, a big regulatory honcho there. I, I poached Barney to Sherman many years ago. He, his, he, he figures it's, it's political. You, you're going to have to get M, old war horse MPs and um, uh, a, 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 you have to have a rump of, of potent MPs to understand what's going on. It'll have to come from parliament, not treasury. That's his view. So I was another question there. Um, yeah, I think Charles has a has a question as well. So Charles, uh, please. Mark, um, have you uh, have you been able to find and read the other nineteen uh, comments that were sent into the Treasury? Uh, no, no, I, I haven't. They haven't have identified. You, have, I'd love to. Well, have you thought of using the Freedom for Information Act to get the Treasury to publish? Uh, I hadn't thought of that. Is it? Does it take a long time? I've no idea. I've never done it myself. I will. Uh, I, you know, that, I will. I will. I, I, I might start by requesting them. They, they, when they when I sent my own little ten page um, res, uh, response in, I got an email back from one of the people at Treasury saying it would be okay if they it looked interesting. Could they send it on to the PRA with whom they work closely and the FC? I said of course. So I could email them. And say, look, at, would you be kind enough to shoot me across a list, I mean, at least a list of the of the uh, respondents? Um, if not, I can't. Otherwise, I have to use FOI. Yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you. <clears throat> we have a, another question from uh, Rob Basson uh, from UBS regarding leverage. Um, he says that 70% of the UK FRN markets back in 2007 was leverage. Based. Start, start again. 70% of 70% was leverage based, including bank treasuries as profit centers, French money market funds, SIVs, SIV lights, even repo funding. So the real money then probably was at the level of the market today. Should we be bringing back uh, buyers well, on the leverage? leverage? Is a comment I, would would would. would uh kind of turn it around on Rob, it, it, would, would the kind of deregulation that I'm advocating result in the sort of arguably over leveraging that we saw back uh, just before the financial crisis? Do I understand correctly? Yes. That's an interesting question. Um, I mean, one of the examples, uh, and uh, any of you can pile in, um, was you look at say Northern Rock before it Went 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 up. But no, they, they they would issue. They they were they were doing short funding on the CP market, a very short term notes, for like six months, uh, six month paper, and on on assets that have, might have a average maturity, let's say for, call it five years or something for the for the mortgages, and and, and that paper uh, would get would get bought, and a lot of the securization paper. You know, three to five year notes would get bought by ABCP conduits, which would issue short term paper. And that paper would get bought by SIBs who were funding themselves 
just before the crisis, it was almost all short-term funding because of the way the rates were doing. So, so they, they'd be CP funding and they'd be, if they were issuing MTNs, it'd be very short-term. And, and that paper was got by, it was, was it 70% of the CIF paper got bought by the US money market funds. So you had this insane leveraging in, in, in an inverted pyramid of, 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 of tenor and like a house, maybe like a house of cards, and and the, the, and and I guess the uh, the that the, the answer to Rob's question is, is first, I, I get what you mean about the pre pre uh, financial crisis uh, leveraging, but but the, but the answer is no, I don't think so because I'm confining my remarks to term securitization, and almost all of the problems that arose in the global markets were. I hate that rubric resecuritization, but that that that's where it came from. It was it was bonds re, being repackaged and 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 and, and the, the shifting of tenor. Um, you know the 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 the, the story on the sieves, and I I acted for the white hats, the good guys on on, on these sieves. Was that they would they would if you picture a balance sheet, uh, a, a a four. Uh, landscape balance sheet, a line down the middle. Assets on your left, liabilities on the right. On the left, you got assets of 11 billion. On the right, you got liabilities of 10 billion and equity of 1 billion. Okay, so it balances. Um, the, the sieves were just that was a sieve balance sheet. It was a leveraged investment vehicle. It the the, the assets were double A weighted, double A uh, um, rate rating average on 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 on. on rated on average, but the liabilities were AAA or A1 plus P1. And, and they got that rating um, largely because of the equity cushion. And, and, and then what, what, what happened was, when, you know, that, 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 that they, they, they arbitraged credit, obviously, the sieves, but they also arbitraged tenor because their underlying assets were three to five years. And as the sieves sort of matured, they, they started funding themselves in the six month market, six to nine month market. And so, of course, once when 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 you can't roll your CP, uh, or the money market funds stop buying, stop stop that, buying. That, that, that's that's interesting, but I think it misses my point, which is probably does. the market. The market itself was funded by those. Yeah, I agree with you. There was a tremendous, you know, circularity behind the sieves. But the point was the market itself was funded by that. And I think all I'm saying is that seventy five percent of the market that hasn't come back probably was that the twenty five or thirty percent that's left where we are today is probably real money and they're probably buying what they bought in the past. I think that, that was merely my point. So I, I'm sorry if I was at cross purpose with the wrong. No, 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 no. What you said is absolutely right. And, and it, absolutely illustrated, it, yeah. it illustrated the point really, which was, you know, that's why I think the securization regulations maybe not in as tough a form as we have them now, but I do think they do a lot of, of useful material because in particular, um, you know, for SIVs and investing in ABCP on SIVs, for example, you would have to have such transparency, nobody you know, would ever do it again. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think that's well, so I, I, I can't sure I completely it. subscribe. And the, the other comment I'd make is that I've never found a problem. And frankly, most of the transactions I do are securizing non performing loan portfolios. I've never found a problem with some um, originators not willing to produce the data tapes that are required by ESMA. They, it's painful and they have to do it. But once they've got it set up, you know, Oh. It's a once off thing to do, and people are happy. But that doesn't yeah. surprise me because any first time originator I've worked with, which has been quite a few, they find the first time, even before the regulatory, the new regulatory environment came into effect, incredibly painful. But they, uh, to a company, they all said, we learned so much about our business that we didn't know. It was, it was definitely worthwhile doing. Um, but uh, the due diligence, I mean, you're going to have a hard time persuading the due diligence requirements on, say, bank investors in top rated RMBS are really necessary. Uh, I mean, I, I, I just don't, I, but I'm not a banker. Uh, you are. Uh, I, I just don't see it. I, I, I just can't see why you need loan level data for the top, for the, for the senior tranche, um, or why you need to monitor it actively. Um, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, well, I think we have time for one last question. Um, we have a question from Nick Locke, uh, who asks about, um, has there been ever really been a liquid UK EU market in securitization notes? Problem with limited liability is no bias when holders want to sell. And that was what that is what happened in 2007, 2008. 
Hence, prices fell significantly. Well, I think, and again, Rob, Rob, I don't know if Rob, Rob is old enough to, to have been around pre-07. I don't know your ages, but... Um, I, I fear so. I was a quant in, a, in the UBS uh -oh. ABS team. So and I had to clear a lot of the stuff up. So, so yeah. you have you have gray hair then. <laughs> okay. uh, I won't comment, but you're right. Okay, no. Uh, well, well I, from uh, my understanding is there was there was secondary market liquidity and then ABS uh, it could be on the well the no I mean it became entirely a seller's market right sorry a, a buyer's market you had these um the weeks as they were called buds wanted come in in competition oh, coming again, out. Again. you had these these lists uh, when the sieves and the civ lights and the the conduits and all I mean in early July 2007, they just hit the sell button and nobody wanted to buy them as catch a falling knife, as they say. And the market. Well, just I know, but that's, that's, during the, that's the financial crisis, though. Yeah, I, I, I know. I'm just explaining, you know. No, I know, but I mean, before, why that happened. I, I, I misunderstood. Did I misunderstand? Before the that, thing? the market was very deep and liquid. Well, yeah. the market was deep and apparently liquid. Yeah. Um, but the reason for that was that, you know, bank trading books were vast. You know, the, the limits on bank trading desks today are maybe a tenth or less of what they were back then because of the market risk requirements, rightly so, now on the, on the trading yeah. desks. So that's where the liquidity came from. Okay. George just launched a, a question, a final question then in the chat. So perhaps you have some time, Mark, to, to answer fine. that. Fine, yeah. um, but it's about um, whether you have any idea whether um, issuances have been structured around the, regu the regulation basically whether there has been sort of creativity from bankers well, and that's lawyers. A, that's a, a really, that is a very good question. I, I don't, I, I know that, well, the short answer is yes. People are trying to skate around that and especially on the 5%, huge amount of work is being done on that um, to evade the, if I'll call it the spirit of the 5% retention. Yes, um, the, the work that I, I like to think we used to, Look, the, the, in my day, before the, uh, the, the regulatory environment, we, 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 we looked at new ways to get assets into paper, new assets and, and, and more efficient structures. That's all we were concerned about, um, bringing odd assets into the mix and, and, and getting it right. And I, I, I would add probably for, for the, uh, as a, one last comment by way of self-defense, for those of you who, who think I, I'm, I'm uh, you know, you wonder why, why, why I'm on a wall is the reason that I have stuck with the market for 30 years. And the reason I think it's such a wonderful market are the twin disciplines of disclosure and rating, even though the rating agencies made a couple of boo-boos along the way. And there was some, there was some faulty disclosure along the way, the twin disciplines of the prospectus and the rating um, make for a different psychology in this market, very different to project finance, extremely different to M&A. And on the whole, you had more technically able lawyers in the early years, uh, more astute and technically advanced bankers. And uh, we were all on the same side. There was no list. Uh, we all, the, the common enemy was time. We wanted to get the deal done. If in doubt, we disclosed. And the rating agencies, you know, we, we, we dealt with the rating agencies by, by explaining the risks better and by dealing with the risks, not by trying to fight them. And so it was the, it was the discipline and the disclosure uh, that, that, that that attracted me and have held me. Um, what's driving me nuts is the regulation, but I'll close on that. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Um, that was a very enlightening. Uh, okay. I think we, we had a lot of economics and uh, finance yeah, yeah, uh, it's, it's a good perspectives mix. as well. Uh, thank, so you thank, much. Much. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much everyone for joining. Thank you all. Uh,